So, Philip, thanks for joining the podcast. So, obviously, we've known each other for a little Absolutely. while. Absolutely. Obviously, we've known each other for a little while. Um, worked together a little bit in the past. But for everyone who doesn't know you, give a little overview of your background and who you are. So, my background, I, um, I kind of started in law enforcement right out of college. And when I was going through that, I started to kind of like think well maybe there's something else you know what's the next level of crime how can I kind of get involved in that so um, it was actually my wife she was like hey I need you home at night and I was like well she's kind of kicking me to actually go down this route so I, I started looking and I saw digital forensics and cyber I'm like well that's kind of cool that and the more I looked at it I was like well I can kind of combine the law enforcement investigation mindset with you know cyber with hacks with all methods of cyber so i went to grad school um started digging into it and i was like okay i like this you know i at the time was like i'm gonna go work for fbi or you know do all this crazy stuff you see on tv and then my first job opening was actually doing digital forensic incident response so i was like okay this will be fun you know we'll, we'll learn some stuff um you know i started doing that um while i was there you know, handled a lot of like computer hacking, intrusion, um, got a, a really good training through IASIS. Um, I did, you know, the SANS courses. I was certified through SANS. Um, from there, I went over kind of back to my roots into the criminal side. So kind of looking at helping law enforcement with um, mobile forensics or even digital video, uh, recovering that kind of stuff. Um, so, which now leads me to here. So it's been, I've been doing this now close to, I don't know, seven, eight years. And then I also, I teach on the side. So, um, it's been pretty fun. All right, cool. Yeah. So digital forensics, especially on kind of the mobile side, seemed like it really came to spotlight. I think that was 2012 after the San Bernardino shooter, the FBI was trying to get Apple to, uh, to engineer a backdoor into their phone, which they weren't going to do. And then it kind of went quiet, but they just figured out another way into it. And it seems like since then, there's like Celebrite, Gray Key, a couple other ones that have been able to crack phones. We actually made a video about because it, it was just like, how are they doing that? Because, you know, Apple was thought of as like <laughs> super secure technology and Android too, depending yeah. on what phone you have. Talk a little bit about that. What typically goes in to a forensics investigation on a phone? So I assume police probably grab the phone as evidence and then sure. hand over to you. What, what, how does that work? So typically, well, I guess it just depends on the phone, but what we'd like to do is tell or advise first responders, take it off the network. The first thing you do, because if you don't, then that device is still susceptible to the remote wiping and all that stuff. That's assuming that they have access to like turn off the Wi-Fi, right? Exactly. Or pop the SIM card out of the phone. But now with the new, you know, iPhone 14, 15 without the SIM card, it makes it challenging. So if you encounter something like that, we recommend putting it in a Faraday bag. And then once we get that Faraday bag back to our lab, we can put it in like a Faraday box where it's isolated. We'll take it, we'll store it in a network isolated area and then we'll wait until we can actually get into it now when we're getting into it phones are different because if you need to leave them on because they're it's all memory so if you turn that phone off it goes into a different state of encryption for lack of a better term yeah, the attack surface is way smaller right exactly yeah so you're not going to get the same information that you would if the phone was still on so that's the big thing with mobile you isolate it off the network to prevent remote wiping and keeping it on it's it's pretty important i mean if you can't you can't and there are things you can do but pri priority would be keep it on off the network that's what a mobile you know forensic examiner would hope to get from every phone Seems like 
it's either with some models, if you have to pop out the SIM card, sometimes you have to take the battery out yeah. first to get to the SIM card, which that's probably yeah, by yeah. design for security. Oh, for sure. Um, we actually, we made a video a while back about, about that. And it seemed like, which don't want to create a playbook for people trying to delete evidence or whatever, but it seemed like they were mainly exploiting hardware vulnerabilities that are unpatchable, usually because it's either on the, the ROM, which is read-only, or some sort of hardware vulnerability itself. Or they're exploiting some sort of vulnerability in like a running process that's on the phone, whether it's like an app. Um, is that right? Yeah, that's usually... Um, there are tools out there that are pretty guarded and, you know, they're not subject to public disclosure. They're proprietarily protected. So as far as going super deep into it, can't really do that, but... Generally, that's the idea. Yeah. What um, I gotta ask, what's the biggest like? W. I don't want to swear because YouTube, but WTF moment <laughs> that <clears throat> you've seen throughout your your time of uh doing mobile forensics. Sure. So, you know, I I think about there's been several, and you know, obviously with as you get into the criminal side and you see things they're disturbing but for one thing is standing out to me um i was able to recover a video i mean it was a it was an overdose overdose death investigation um and somebody had planted a hidden camera in this room and it looked like it was like almost like a special needs facility and you know law enforcement responded and it was the in initial story was well this guy you know overdosed on something on his own well watching this video you see somebody come in and give this individual a powdery substance like he just like watches him and helps him to ingest this substance and then you are literally watching him as he starts to overdose and his chest just stops moving and then you see you know the paramedics come in and they start working him and there's just, you know, there's no, he's just gone. Um, so that to me, that was pretty disturbing to actually see that and know that, wow, this isn't real. This really happened. Um, there's been, you know, murders that I've seen with those videos uh, where it just same reaction. You're like, holy cow, that just happened in real life. Um, you know, and then there's always the weird the weird stuff that you find that you can use your imagination, what people get into and stuff you find when you start looking into people's phones. But uh, those two stories, I think, stand out. Um, oh, that and uh, some of the cartel torture videos are kind of, you know, just kind of disturbing because, you know, for a while there we were getting into, you know, assisting some federal agencies with cartel investigations and, you know, you start thinking, wow, this was probably shot from this phone, and it just, you know, kind of makes you think. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure there's, there's probably a lot of that down here in uh, Arizona. I know, uh, like, no, yeah. on I-10 going down to Tucson. Yeah. Uh, I actually, I worked with a guy who had just spent time, he's with Homeland Security, and he had just spent time down in that area, and then they were he moved up to where I am, and they're still, you know, working cases between the two areas. But, yeah, you, that area is hotbed. Yeah, they, like, when you drive down, I notice they pull over a ton of vehicles. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure it's just, like, it seems like there's so much, at least public, when they publicly talk about it, that there's so much that they know it's just a numbers game. If you pull up a certain amount of vehicles, like, every day they'll run into something like human trafficking or drug trafficking. Um, so I'm sure they're yeah. very busy down there. What about to shift kind of more back to forensics? What do you think is like the differences between doing forensics on mobile versus on say like a Windows or a Mac? I doubt you're doing any Linux, but Windows yeah, or yeah. A Mac. Um. So I think the biggest thing is that volatility. So you know, if you turn a phone off for the most. You're still going to get some stuff, don't get me wrong, but if you turn that phone off and you don't get a password, you're not going to get a lot. Like, I mean, it's, you know, since it's memory-based information, it kind of shuts down and you're not going to duplicate it. Whereas with a computer, 
obviously, you know, you're, what's on the hard drive is on the hard drive. Um, as long as you can get through that encryption, if there is encryption, you're going to be able to still see it. You may not be able to see the, you know, the memory resident stuff, but you're still going to be able to get and see, um, you know, what's on the hard drive. And I think, too, I, you know, I dare to, I hate to say this, but I think with phones, a lot of times you're getting more real-time, up-to-date personal information. I think, you know, we're, we've, not that we've gotten rid of computers because we use them, but we're more of a mobile society now, you know, like what we used to be able to do or have to have a computer to do, we can do on our phones. Like there's, we're almost cutting that out. So I think you're getting a lot more maybe non-business related information on a phone as opposed to computers seem to be a lot more corporate in nature or business related stuff. Yeah, I imagine there's probably more demand to crack, like say, a Windows or, or Mac, because with like an iPhone or most Androids, mm -hmm. you probably wouldn't need to crack it because the person is probably there. So you just grab his thumb and put it on the thing or face scan and it pretty much unlocks it. So it's it's interesting because, you know, during the interrogation, I like to stress to investigators, take the time to talk and try to get that password. Um you know, and it all depends. Like, I, I'm sure you could force compliance. And if you really wanted to try to do the biometric or the thumbprint, if you had a judge willing to give you that permission. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, outside, if, if they don't give you that password, some sometimes you get in. But a lot of times, especially with Apple, it's very difficult without using those special cracking tools. Like, uh, you know, they just it's really difficult with Apple. It really is. Yeah, they're. I mean, they're a good product. That's, yeah, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. One thing that I, th that I think is interesting is obviously Celebrite and Greg have been very good at, at cracking phones, yeah. but you also have seen some some of those commercial spywares, which are illegal in the U.S. Uh, I mean, sanctioned by the U.S. government, but they're extremely good at getting access to phones remotely, which it's kind of, sort of an anomaly. Um, some, somewhat unfortunate that they've gone the route, I shouldn't say somewhat, unfortunate that they've gone the route of being somewhat adversarial, that they've, um, it's been found in like U.S. diplomats' phones and stuff, or he's targeted. But I, I don't think necessarily alone that you have a technology like that is bad, it's just like there needs to be a little accountability. But sure. talk a little bit about that. What's your take on that? Like with Pegasus, for example, you know, the courts have recently said, well, this is illegal and it's bad and you know you have to turn over your source code to meta i think it was you know they're a foreign company so okay we turn our source code over which they probably won't do but that doesn't mean it's not going to still be there you know then again these these companies are developing this stuff be it for good reasons or bad reasons if you know it's still going to get out there and it's still going to do a lot of damage and they're stealthy you know and all it takes is just a tweak of the code a little bit you know every day and people are going well how do i catch it now you know i tweak it a little bit more how do i catch it and it's it's just i mean it's the world we live in i guess i don't i don't know currently how we're going to deal with it but it's something we're going to have to deal with yeah, it seems like like that court really set up kind of like a weird precedent, at least for the companies that they sell to generally democratic countries that have, you know, courts and like mm -hmm. rule of law. Because if I remember correctly, Meta and Google, some of them, they were angry, mainly angry. Obviously, they were angry because their customers were being targeted sometimes in not so good ways. Right. But what they really didn't like, it seemed like, was that it was totally exposing holes in their product as far as security goes. Yeah. Uh, and then you have companies that operate more of a, I would say proper legal sense, like for example, like, like Celebrite or Gray Key, where Apple probably has the same qualms with them, which is that they want to create this product that's seen as like, you know, the gold standard of security and they're kind of getting proven wrong, which seems like it, it right. may affect some of that too. Oh, for sure. And, you know, at any cyber incident, that's always a factor, right? That companies don't want to reveal they've been hacked because then that's reputational damage and they're not going to, you know, have the same reputation and then people are going to question them. And so that kind of dampens any kind of public awareness. 
What about, so as far as some of the uh, spyware on the dark web, it's kind of spyware as a service where it's much more readily available to basically anyone with some Bitcoin, unlike yep. Pegasus and Predator and some of those which are more tightly controlled. How are you typically seeing those installed? Um, is it done through kind of your typical phishing or like Trojan apps or are you seeing more sophisticated exploits? Honestly, it's those apps. I mean, I know they say that they go through a security review and, you know, whatever. They're only, but things are going to get through. So there's thousands of apps that are coming out, you know, pretty regularly. So I think you're seeing a lot of that through those apps. We're also seeing those random text messages, the phishing text messages, and, you know, people are just clicking on them because it's just a habit. I mean, if you think it's almost like phishing emails, right? Like I can, if I'm a bad guy, I can send a million phishing emails and I only need one or two to get through. So it's it, kind of the same concept with mobile. What about like on the supply chain? I mean, you hear about supply chain, especially with ransomware and stuff. You hear about supply chain attacks happening all the time. What about as far in the, the mobile realm? Do you see a lot of supply chain tax like say for example like like spotify like if someone wanted to gain access to a bunch of people's phones everybody has spotify and they could potentially embed some sort of spyware um have you seen or heard of anything like that happening i have not personally but at least theoretically absolutely that's huge that would be massive you bring you just scared me thinking about that like i mean leveraging spotify to piggyback and to just go I mean, that's a great attack vector. Let's shift a little bit. So you mentioned earlier that you did more traditional incident response in, in say, traditional computer networks versus, like, mobile. Can you talk a little bit about any interesting stories that you've seen, kind of what some of those look like as far as kind of the malware and how you'd analyze it? Yeah, so you, we've seen, or I've seen, a lot, like, defacement, which, again like we've talked about in the past, you know, it's something that it's shock value is huge. You know, I've seen a government website get, you know, defaced with pro ISIS material. Now, it's scary. They got in, it's embarrassing, but nine times out of 10 with that kind of hacktivist stuff, it's more like graffiti on a wall. It's, you know, it's damaging, but kind of ends there. Um, However, you know, we've seen, or I've seen like um, Ryuk, the Emotet stuff, where it goes in and it laterally moves. It is looking to gain access. It's going to do, it's going to be like the malware that does the bar cooking barbecue low and slow as long as it can. And it's going to sit and it's going to hide. And you may not see it until it's already been there for a while. But, you know, usually with malware, we will... You know, either through a VM, if it's a like a virtual server, you t you could clone that, try to get all the memory you can out of it, and then you would almost take that image and put it into like your forensic machine and run it like a dead box, you know, forensics. Now you're not collecting it the same, but you're going to run it through your tools, and then hopefully there's going to be some kind of automated that'll kind of pick it up auto right away, and you can kind of compare what it's doing with already known samples. Um, but if it's something that hasn't been seen before, it's a lot of times it's just kind of the process of going through. You're going to look at, okay, you know, what seems abnormal here? Like you start with the wide net and then kind of bring it down. You know, Sands has those posters that say to no normal find or to find evil, no normal. So that's why it's always good to have a good understanding of your environment. Because if you know what your normal environment looks like, then something that's not supposed to be there is going to pop out very easily. But, you know, okay, we go back in, we find these abnormal processes, and then we just kind of start to look around and say, well, that doesn't seem, that doesn't seem normal. Then maybe we find a, an executable file in there or a DLL or something that just doesn't seem right or... You start looking at, okay, well, here's a Windows log that says at this time, you know, remote connection, RDP was tried. And, okay, well, what happened right before that? Okay, what happened right before that? And then you just kind of track it back from there, or you move forward from there to see, okay, were they able to get in, and where did they go? 
And then as far as so they made the intrusion and then, you know, you can take those malware samples. They're automated like tools online or wherever where you can upload them and they'll run in like a virtual sandbox or you take it and you run it in some debuggers or a code or, you know, and you look at the function calls that that is making. And then maybe you set up a an analysis machine where you actually run it and see what it does. Yeah, and you start seeing like what what domains it's calling to, exactly. yep. Uh, yep. what it's communicating. Yep. Um, there was actually I was at CactusCon, which is kind of like a cybersecurity conference here in Arizona. It's kind of like what's the one in Vegas? Why am I blank on the name? Like um, Black Hat. Or, yeah. Uh, not Black Hat. What's the uh, one right after Defcon? it? Defcon. It's kind of like a Defcon, yep. but for like more okay. local. And yeah. so somebody actually did. So they have this like talk. It's kind of like a called Snow Talk, where like. So not like confidential, but it probably doesn't need to be on like YouTube. Sure. Um, and so someone went and they were like investigating a phishing, a phishing email. And so they, they went to the domain, figured like the directory was open, um, started, started moving around, like looking about what was going on, figured out like who it was. Um, I believe it was, it was out of somewhere in Africa, although I think they bought some of the <laughs> malware from, um, off the dark webs or probably Russian malware. What about... What about like on the DDoS side where no one's actually gained like access and it's just solely they're just directing traffic? How, one, I guess, how do you how do you investigate that? And I, I guess all you can do is what is block the IP addresses that you see that are that are sending the traffic. Yeah, I mean you can do that. You know, if you start talking about like botnet DDoS attacks, you know, it's there's going to be a lot more. IP addresses than just the one. Um, so you go to like the, you know, the bigger, I guess the subnets and all that. Um, you can go into that. You add, you know, more speed, and then, you know, at the very worst of it, if it's, you know, if it's not if it's not a critical service, I guess you just shut it down and try to restart it. You know, I mean, it's that's the with botnets, especially using that DDoS, you know, potentially have millions of things, you know, that you, it just kind of one of those things you got to deal with. For example, like when a botnet happens, you know, it gets installed on someone's, uh, the botnet malware gets installed on people's routers, computers, and then those are used to carry out the attack. A lot of times, so it looks like it's coming from like normal IP addresses that you expect it to come from. Right. Are those people ever informed? Like, your device was compromised. You weren't really part of the actual breach, but in that sense, but you were. Right. Your devices I, I were compromised. I, I honestly don't know. I know that I've never. I'll confess, I've never made a notification like that to an individual person. It seems like it's, it's really doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> it's still out there. It, it seems like it happens. So let's talk a little bit about. You mentioned kind of your path into forensics. What did you believe before you got into forensics that? <laughs> Nowadays, you're like, what? I think that things you believed back then, and how has your opinions changed now? Oh my gosh! So, I will confess, I was, I guess, influenced by like the movies, right? So, you know, there's those cybersecurity hacker movies that are out there where you know it seems like they're walking around sniffing the air, going, "I smell Wi-Fi." You know, where's the? I I, I know it's like that it was like that or you see a video where somebody just pounds on a keyboard for 10 seconds and they've already made entry into the grid and you know they shut it down i thought it was like that knowing that now what i know that was that's completely ridiculous you know they the movies make it seem like it's so fast when really there's probably been months and months and years of recon that's been going on to get into there um also i honestly didn't realize how heavy hacking and intrusions really are like how much cyber activity or cyber attacks are happening every single day that we never even have a clue the general public will never know the amount of uh cyber attacks that happen and it's 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 crazy like i honest to god never thought the level of activity was so high and and it, frighteningly i didn't realize that the lack of attention that most people have even our you know from a government perspective you know like governments do their best and you know we we do what we can and we're you know trying but there's just so much of it that there's i mean i don't know 
maybe it's just the nature of the beast with automation and computer programming that maybe you can't put enough people. Maybe, you know, like it's just constantly growing so fast that it's just, it's a massive, massive problem. It seems like for the most part, the only breaches that really get disclosed are either if it's critical infrastructure that the federal government has some sort of say in, or if it's people's data getting exposed. But outside yeah. of that, it seems like a lot really doesn't ever get exposed, yeah. which makes you wonder sometimes when you see like an outage, like especially nowadays, it seems like the past few weeks there was the Facebook outage of or meta outage. Yeah. There was uh, had the, had same the same thought. thought. There was a couple other social media. LinkedIn had one. And it makes yeah. you wonder, like, are those breaches that they just don't want to admit to because it didn't get to people's data? Especially when we well, see kind be. of consecutive ones like that. Right. And then, uh, you know, they come out immediately and say, well, it was definitely not a cyber breach. It was definitely not a hack. It was definitely not this. And the first thing you're going, well, would they tell me if it was? Like, you know, I mean, why would you expose your company like that, you know, to the bad reputation? Yeah, it seems like in the U.S. we've gotten pretty good at, you know, if you commit cyber crimes in the U.S. and you continue to do it, you eventually will get caught. The problem yeah. is a lot of countries, they're out, they're out of the jurisdiction. There's really not much you can do. The, right. They always have those um, press conferences say, yeah, we're charging this person with this crime. But unless they ever come and go into the U.S. or a country that the U.S. cooperates with and has extradition treaties, right. it's really nothing you can do. No, I mean, and let's be honest, the... F- you know, the FBI is probably not going to go to the Seychelles because, you know, a, a couple people in, you know, some small town got their credit card stolen. It's just they may indict. They may make a case. But like you said, they're probably the reality is nothing's probably really going to happen. Or even even like they did the big lock bit takedown the other day. And uh, yeah. yeah, it's a big announcement of celebration within three days. They're back up and running. They probably <laughs> just had yeah. backups. Spun off the news hours, put them on there. I don't know if you saw the meme, but it was a person like that, that they were identified as Lockbit, and then it said, "Okay, FBI," and the FBI had like a gun pointed at Lockbit, and then right behind the FBI was another person with Lockbit with a gun to the FBI. So, I mean, it was kind of like that, you know. It's, you know, yeah, we got you, but then they're right behind, you know. It's, like, it's just kind of how it goes. Yeah, it seems like, too, you're probably going to start seeing pretty soon, like, AI-powered malware, which they're not necessarily going to have, like, AI like embedded in the actual malware on the computer, but it could easily call to a server that does have some AI in its right. data center right. that could start really increasing the functionality or make it more stealthy by you know, changing IP addresses, as well as auto-analyzing and moving quicker and being more evasive. Right. right. It's terrifying. I mean, you know, just with chat GPT alone, I can say, hey, write me a Python script to, you know, inventory all my, you know, supplies. And it does it to the T perfection in a matter of seconds. And that's, you know, that's just chat GPT. Imagine a, you know, super AI that's only focused on that. I mean, my God, (laughs) that's terrifying. So one last question before we uh, we end it here. So if you're going into, say, a forensics investigation, say you have a network, what are the go-to tools that you're using? Oh, gosh. For a network, I'm probably going to use FTK Imager if I have to do, like, a, a server live image. And then, you know, I'll be honest, I'm a Magnet fanboy. I, I like Magnet Axiom. Um, it does a really good job, I think, with, like, kind of visualizing a timeline and everything. That's not to say the other tools aren't good. Every You know, it's you can never have enough tools right you, you never just have one tool in the toolbox but for me personally i like the way that axiom kind of shows me everything i need to know um and then combine that with ftk imager i know magnet has like a an ability to kind of grab your own image with magnet but i still prefer ftk imager with magnet as an analysis tool what about for mobile forensics say you have like a new iphone with current os uh, <laughs> you're gonna have to wait a while. <laughs> no, um, honestly, your two big primaries are gonna be, and I think everybody knows, the cell brighter to your gray keys. Those are kind of, you know, where it's at. And honestly, I think so. Gray key and magnet actually merged, so there you go. But um, 
But yeah, your Celebrite, your uh, Grey Key are going to be the two go to for pretty much any mobile investigation. I know it's been theorized that you could take apart or disassemble part of the phone and start potentially almost like a man in the middle attack, but start like monitoring the uh, communications between the different chips, the different components of the phone. Uh, right. Or even talking about it for brute force, you could start monitoring the kind of the electromagnetic signals within the phone to get a better idea of, you know, if you're off or if you're getting close. Has any of that actually come to fruition as far as like a proof of concept that that can actually be done? If it has, I haven't seen it. <laughs> you know, different agencies probably have all kinds of crazy stuff, but... Um, Maybe the NSA I or somebody. Right. I, I've been in trainings when people that work for those agencies have been asked and they've basically said, there's nothing I can say about that. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. I appreciate you coming on. Um, yeah, for sure. 